on. Shlishi, the third reading of Parsha Tzav, after having spoken about sin offerings and guilt offerings and the Kohenim's participation in how these are brought, we move on to the Thanksgiving offering. V'zeis toiras zevach hashlamen. This is the teachings, or the rules that govern the korban, the offering, which is called shlamen, the peace offering. Asher yakriv Hashem, which is brought before God. So it's interesting to note that the korban of shlamim only comes after chatas. But that's in Pasha Tzav. The Pasha Vayik is not like that. So one of the reasons for this is, says Ramban, is because now we speak about the Kohanim and their involvement and what they stand to gain. And one might think that the reason that the Kohanim would be interested in doing what they have to do is because they get a piece, because they have a major role to play. They have to eat the Korban Chatos. But the point that's being made here is that even with regard to Ashlamim, which a person brings in order to express his thanksgiving to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so here the Kohen is not the sole eater. Here the Kohen comes later on. And because Pasha Tzav speaks about that which goes to the Kohenim, we begin with the emphasis on the areas where the Kohen plays the dominant role. And now we move on to the Shlomim, where the Kohenim, insofar as consumption of the offering, are playing a secondary role, as we will hear, because a large part of the offering, the Korban, is eaten by the person who brings the Korban. Now here it says, Asher Yakrev Hashem. To whom else would we bring an offering? And previously, it doesn't say, Asher Yakrev Hashem, that you bring it close to God. It says, Asher Yakrev. So why here does it say, Asher Yakrev Hashem? So the Kliyakar says, that all of the other sins, they come for a reason. What's the reason for, all well, the other offerings, pardon me, they come for a reason. And the reason is, sin, a lack, a deficiency, a shortcoming. It's something you need to make up for. Because you did a sin, because you did a chet, you have to bring a carbon chatos. And as such, so it's not so close to Hashem, because it is a little bit of a self-serving element. But the carbon shlomim is not because I have an issue. The carbon shlomim is because I want to come closer to Hashem. And that's why here it emphasizes Zevach HaShlomim Asher Yakriv LaHashem because it's the Korban Shlomim that brings a person closest to Hashem not when I do this out of obligation, out of necessity, because I did something wrong, but rather because I seek closeness to our Kaddish Baruch Hu. Whereas we'll see, there are other possibilities for a Korban Teida. It could not only be because I seek closeness to Hashem, but in fact, it could also be because I have an opportunity and a responsibility to say thank you for a miracle that has occurred. Now another interesting thing about the introduction of the Korban Shlomim is it doesn't say Yakrivu. It also says Yakriv as if future tense. So the Vayikir Abba says when Mashiach will come all of the other Korbanot will be phased out. Why would they be phased out? Exactly. No more sins. No more Korban Chatas. No more guilt, no more carbon ashram. We're not going to make these kind of mistakes. But one carbon will remain. What carbon is that? The carbon shlom. And that's why it's Madua, that's Yakriv. Lashen Asid says the Vayikir Rabbah, because even in the future, even after people finish making up for whatever they did wrong during the time of Galut, and even after all those offerings are brought, the carbon Taida is still going to remain in place. Okay, with this little preface, let's get into the meat of the offering. Or I should say, meat and bread. Pretty funny. <laughs> if the teida, if it's being brought as an act of thanksgiving, the hikriv al zevach teida, then he'll bring close or offer, along with this zevach, the slaughtering of the teida, chalais, matzais, belulais, bashemen, loaves of unleavened wafers or breads, and these will be kneaded in oil. Rekike matzah, wafers of matzah, which are meshuchim b'shaman, which are glazed in oil. Vesoyles, mirubeches, and dough that is scalded, which are also chalas, also loaves. And these are belulays b'shaman. These will also be kneaded in oil. So we have three kinds of bread. 
in addition to these three kinds of bread, which we'll soon find out, requires ten loaves apiece. Al chalas lechem chametz. There's another ten loaves, and this is chametz, which Yakriv karbonay al zevach toidas shlomov, that he'll bring together with his karbon, which is brought as an act of thanksgiving. So we got a lot of bread. Forty is loaves. It possible is it possible to have a challah that's not chametz? You're stuck in your image of a challah of today. A challah simply means a loaf, a piece of bread. It means water and flour. It's kneaded together, and then it's baked. You could bake it before it has a chance to rise or after it has a chance to rise. Matzah does not have to look round and flat. That's what Passover matzah looks like. Matzah could come in various forms. The point is that once the flour and water are mixed together, so the flour has an agent called Amy B. Lacey, or Amy D. Lacey. And what happens is, let me see. What happens is when the flour gets mixed with water, or alkaline really, anything which is alkaline based, what happens is it triggers a chemical reaction. The chemical reaction begins to, to arise. That's what happens. When it comes together, when the consistency unites, when the, the particles of flour unite, so the, 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 what you would call, I guess, the side effect of this fermentation which is called chimutz, is that little air pockets develop and it rises. And that's what we call chametz. And that's prohibited on Pesach. But in the Beis HaMikdash, all of the loaves that were brought, the vast majority of karbam menachot, all the offerings that were brought, the meal offerings, as well as the vast majority of bread that came along with the karbam, was always, specifically, the concept of, chum, of matzah. Not that it looked like a matzah or a matzah. Because, here's the thing, this chemical reaction that gets triggered when alkaline meets Amy B, once it comes in contact with intense heat, it gets killed on the spot. So that kills the chemical reaction. It can't rise again afterwards. Whether you do that through boiling hot water, whether you do that through, through frying, or whether you do that through dry baking, either way, the heat would kill the agent. Okay. So that's why it's called matzah. So people send, tend to think of challah and matzah in a singular form. You know what challah looks like, you know what matzah looks like, and you're wondering, how could you have challahs matzahs? Sounds like a contradiction in terms. The matzah as you know it, and the challah as you know it, cannot be one and the same. That is correct. But a loaf of un- unleavened bread <coughs> from various forms. So in this particular instance, this is the one instance where you're allowed to have chametz? This is the one instance where ten of the breads are chametz, and that's why we don't bring a carbon toida on Pesach. And that's why this Mizma Lasoda, which is the psalm that expresses thanksgiving to Hashem, that we recite immediately after Baruch Shamar, we do not recite it during Pesach. And then Erev Pesach. We omit it. Why? Because there's no carbon toida brought. Why don't we bring a carbon toida on Erev Pesach in the morning? Because you have to finish all the breads by midday. And that would be unreasonable. So anytime we don't bring a carbon toida, we don't actually recite that psalm. So why do we place the carbon toida during Pesach? I mean, today it's a right? What replaced the carbon toda during Pesach? There was no carbon toda during Pesach. So it, we can consider the halal as carbon toda. If you had to hey, say thank you, you brought your carbon the day after Pesach. <laughs> there was not a daily obligation to bring a carbon toda. It wasn't a daily obligation. No. It's a carbon yachet. This is a private offering. So why does somebody bring a carbon toda? Or why would somebody be obligated to bring a carbon toda? Let's take a look in Rashi. Rashi now, we're on Parsha Tzav, the seventh chapter. We just read the 12th verse. So Rashi says like this. Im al korban toida yakrivenu. If it's al toida, if it's due to a thanksgiving yakrivenu that the person draws close. Says Rashi. Im, if the reason that impels him to bring this korban is al dvar haida, because he or she wishes to express, his, express and acknowledge al nes shenasale, a miracle that has happened to them. Kigoin. What kind of miracle does it have to be? One of those miracles and wonders that one reads about in, in the Bible? <laughs> what kind of miracle or wonder is it? So, Neis Shanasala is Kigoin, Yer De Hayom, like people who make a trans oceanic journey. Once upon a time, whenever you got onto one of these boats that made a trans oceanic journey, you were always taking a risk. You're always taking a risk. Because if a gale storm would hit, you're done. And there are many stories of gale storms hitting and people never coming home. Sailors took a risk. 
we didn't have the technology we have today. We couldn't predict well, when, when it would rain or when it wouldn't. You could leave shore, be a balmy, beautiful day, and six hours later, a storm could hit at sea. So there was always a risk. Very famous Jewish people were lost forever. The Rambam lost his brother in, in such a uh, monsoon off the, in the Indian Ocean. The Rambam had a brother, his name was Abdavid, and he, he, he was lost in a monsoon. He was a, a merchant, and he would go to India, he would buy all kinds of materials, fine materials, and bring them back to the Middle East, to Israel, and sell them. And that's how he, in Egypt, that's how he sustained the family. Now the truth is, once upon a time, the greatest commerce was done in this way. Why? Because business always, in a sense, relies on, on risk. Profit and risk are directly related. If there's no risk in the investment, you can't expect to get high yields. You want to get high yields, you've got to take a risk. That's the nature of business. GICs don't offer you much, but you're secure. A lot of people will happy to be secure, and they don't want to get offered much. Other people say, I can't make a living on that. I've got, I got to do business. So there's a whole formula they use of risk assessment, and you lose here, and you gain there. And in the end, you hope you come out on top. Well, many people have called Bay Street a casino, and I'm not so sure it isn't. But at any rate, the point being is once upon a time, the most lucrative business was business of bringing merchandise from distant places. Why? Because it had the greatest risk. First of all, you don't know if you were going to come back alive. Secondly, you had all this merchandise. You'd spend all this money, and you had to bring all the merchandise, and had to come back. So when a person would make it across a trans-oceanic journey, he would make this bracha. Incidentally, because that's the halacha, so when we cross over a transatlantic flight, we still make this bracha. Even though aviation is relatively safe, and it's probably safer to fly in a plane despite all the terrible things that we hear about to get into your car and drive to work. Nonetheless, since we talk about the trans-oceanic, even though we don't have the dangers of once upon a time, we still remain with that thing. You know, the Misha Feinstein held any time you take a flight, you have to make a bracha of, of, a, of a gomel. But most of the Paschim do not agree with that. No, I don't know anybody who does that today. But if you fly across the ocean, that's another story. Holchemidbaris, people who make a trans desert journey. There's a place in the United States called Death Valley. Yeah. You know why it's called Death Valley? It's pretty desolate. Yeah, it's pretty desolate, and a lot of people died on the way. If you ran out of water, you ran out of luck. There was nothing you couldn't do. You couldn't ride as quickly as you could, but if you ran out too early, that was the end. Chavushe Beisasurim, people who are incarcerated. Now, incarceration in today's day and age may be so much safer than incarceration of antiquity, but it's still a dangerous business. And there are gangs, and you have to get protected, and your protection costs you sometimes awful prices to pay. It's a very, very scary place. So when a person, Achman Lutzan, is incarcerated and comes out of incarceration, then he has to bring this korban. And the fourth and final is Chayla Shinnasrape, a person who was threatened with a debilitating illness, not that he had a cold or a strep throat, a serious debilitating illness, and came out of that debilitating illness. Shaheim, that these four people, Tzrichim Lahaydis, they are required, they're mandated to acknowledge Hashem's kindness. We'll talk in a minute about that. Shakas of Bahen, that it says about them in Psalm 107, which incidentally is by custom recited every single Friday afternoon right before Mincha. And the reason is you made it through a week, a week of snarling traffic, a week of aviation, a week of all kinds of things where, bad, where the dangerous things are going to happen. And Baruch Hashem, you made it to another Shabbos. So we recite this psalm. And in this psalm it says, David Melech says in chapter 21 and 22 of the psalm, he says, Yoidu la Hashem chastai. Yoidu, the word Yoidu means acknowledge, like the word Hoidoya. La Hashem to God chastai is kindness. Benifla Esav and his wonders live ne Adam to humanity. And then what does it say afterwards? Yoidu la Hashem chastai. Acknowledge Hashem's kindness. And then what should you do? And then it says, V'yizbichu zivchei saida. And they will bring slaughterings of thanksgiving. In other words, karbanot of thanksgiving. So we learn from this pasuk, by the way, two things. It says, Yoidu la Hashem chastai livnei Adam. The years because if we say that we see there's a responsibility for us to acknowledge Hashem kindness, we have to say thank you. That's very important to point out. It's first and foremost. 
And after the notion that we have to say thank you, that we're morally impelled, if you will, or menschlichkeit impelled, however you want to call it, but we have a, an obligation, a Torah obligation, to say thank you. So after we have this obligation to say thank you, we, we do it by means of a korban. But it's, it's, it's um, Rashi doesn't bring this down here, but that's done in a public fashion. And that's why in today's day and age where we don't have the korban, we make sure to say the special blessing called HaGomel. And where do we recite the Gomel? The tradition has become that we recite it at a Torah. Why? Because the Torah is never read unless there's a public, unless there's a minion. So since that's the part that always you're guaranteed to get a minion, that's why it became customary that when somebody gets an aliyah at the Torah, that's when he makes a gomel, or even if you don't get an aliyah, the Torah is taken out, that's when you make the bracha of a gomel. The Rambam says, the Rashi says like this, that al-achas me'ele, if for one of these reasons, nodar shlomim halolo, this person would have brought a shlomim and peace offering, so it's not a regular shlomim. It's not a regular peace offering. It's a peace offering which is called shalme toda hain. This is a different kind of peace offering. There's a peace offering which a person could bring only because he wants to be closer to Hashem. Did you know that? You don't need a reason to bring a carbon. <laughs> if you want to bring a carbon, just like that, you're welcome to do so. Come to the base of Migdash. I want to bring a carbon. Why? I'm happy. I'm grateful. I want to bring a carbon. I want to be closer to Hashem. No problem. What kind of carbon do you bring? You can't bring a carbon chatos. You have to sin for that. You don't want to bring a carbon chatos. Carbon chatos is when there's an imperfect situation. Asham, even worse, guilt. You don't want to do that. What kind of carbon could you bring? A shlomim. Having said that, there's a subsection of the shlomim. And the subsection of the shlomim is when it's being done as an act of specific thanksgiving because you're one of these four people. And that's when it's not just called a korban shlomim, but it's called a shalme toda. It's called not an ordinary peace offering, but a peace offering that's brought for the reason of saying thank you. That's called shalme toda. So the shalme toda, and these shalme toda have a special halacha. And the special halacha is v'te'un lechem. With these shlomim, these four people, their shlomim requires bread, which we said is actually matzah for the most part, but Ha'omer binyan, the pinnacle is the special, these loaves. The eno ne'acholen, they are only eaten le'yoyim, the Lila, the day of the Korban and the night that follows. And rabbinically, that means you have to finish it by midnight. Kamesham of Furish Khanas is explained. As we go on now to say, and that's why Pasuk, verse 12, Pasuk Yud Beis begins, Im al de Because the first introduction is Korban Shlom. And the Korban Shlom as a Asha Yakriv la Hashem, that you're drawing close to God. Drawing close to God. That's first and foremost. That's what this is about, as the, as the Kliyakar said. You're not bringing it because any of any specific reason. However, if what's impelling you to come close to Hashem is your need to say thank you, to acknowledge Hashem's kindness, if it's al if it's al so then the hikri of al Then we have the pasuk says chalas matzes belul b'shem and kikim matzes b'shukum b'shem and miruveches chalas. That's when we have the loaves, the wafers, the bagels, and so on and so forth. So Rashi says, Arbo mini lechem, four kinds of bread, chalais, loaves, rekikin, wafers, uruvucha. For lack of better terminology, I'll call it a bagel. It means that which is scalded in hot water before it's baked or fried. Vishloisha mini matzah. These three kinds are not the challah you're used to. Challah is just a euphemism today. Challah means a specific kind of braided bread for Shabbos. That's what it's come to mean. But challah just means really. It means a piece of bread. It means dough, which is baked. So these three are mini matzah. These three kinds of challah are unleavened. Uchsivin, it says, al chalas lechem chum. It's the next pasuk, verse 13, it says, and if you'll bring, what kind of loaves? Leaven loaves. V'chom min, each one of these four different kinds of loaves, the three unleavened and the one leavened, how many loaves do you bring? How many loaves? Eser chalas. Ten loaves. This is explained in the Gemara Masech Menachas on page 77. And how much is it? A measure of flour, a Jerusalem, a specific Jerusalem measure of flour, which is called a saw. This is not a small amount. Now the Jerusalem, had a, they had a larger system of measurement. 
Shem Shisha Midbaris, which make for six of the, what they call the desert standard. And this is Esrim Isarin, 20 Isarin. The Isarin was a tenth of an Eifa that we talked about earlier. Some of the Karbonot, some of the offerings were a tenth of an Eifa. And this is something which is, is uh, Sheish Se'in is 20 of those Isarin. Some Karbonot said one Isarin, this is 20 of those Isarin. And that's each one of the saw. So we're not talking about tiny little bagels. We're not talking about tiny little chals. We're talking about, we're talking about loaves. 40 loaves. Now the coin gets one of each. So the coin gets four, which means you still have 36 loaves. And the 36 loaves have to be consumed? Short period of time, like by midnight. Like by midnight, like the day of the carbon and the evening that follows. And you have to, besides consuming 36 loaves of bread, Meat. you also have to consume a whole animal. No? <laughs> Sounds like one of those uh, eating contests. Yeah. So how could that be? What did you say? Dr. Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein diet, yeah. After. <laughs> How could it be? How could, the only way is if I bring it. The only way is if you have to bring people together. And that's where the custom comes, that when people thank Hashem, they make a su'udat hodaya. They sponsor a kiddush, or they make a fabrengen, and they invite their friends over. And that way, we, we know that it's been ever since when? Since the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, the original fabrengens. I mean, for sure, Mordechai was a chassid. Who else could have made a yomtif where you're supposed to, so to speak, say l'chaim to the point that you go out of your limitations? Yeah, only a chassid come up with that. But, but the idea of a fabrengen, meat and, meat and bread, that goes back to Maish Rabbeinu. Time to the time of the, of the Mishkan. Why? You had a toda, 36 loaves and an animal. There's no way to do this by yourself. So you invite friends over. If you invite, if Yidna are sitting together and thanking Hashem and eating kachim, eating that which comes from the base of Migdash, they're definitely not talking about Monday Night Football. What are they talking about? They're talking about holy things? No, that's a fabrengen. Miruveches, what is that? Lechem cholot. This is scalded bread. Bereschen in boiling hot water called sarkay. Now, by the way, when you took dough and you scalded it in boiling hot water, what do you think happened to the dough? What happened to the live agent? The leavening agent? It's dead. It's dead. It's finished. So actually it was matzah. Very different matzah than we would imagine today. But it's nonetheless matzah. So this is the business, the opening volley of the business about the korban shlomim and specifically the korban todah. So we're going to study today one of my favorite teachings about the korban todah. An amazing, an amazing teaching from the Rebbe from the year 1985 about the concept of the korban todah. The Rebbe says, we just learned together in Rashi, that there's four different kinds of people. Okay. So the Rebbe brings down that there's a tour. Where the tour says, Nasan Simon la Matzav Melu. He gives a sign for these four different kinds of situations. The transoceanic voyager, the person that goes across the desert, the, the incarcerated individual, and the person who's threatened by debilitating illness. Four different kinds. You get out of the situation. At that point, you make an act of thanksgiving to Hashem, in the time of the Beis Migdash, an offering, and then a fabrengen. These days and age, a gomel at the Torah, and a fabrengen. So the tour says, we say every single day in our, in our Amidah, in Ashmon Esrei, it says, V'chol ha-chayim yeducha sala. All those who are alive, they thank you for eternity. So he says, chayim, life, everybody knows what chayim is, right? If they don't know what chayim is, they know what l'chayim is. But the Lama in front just means two life. So Chaim is life. He said, yeah, what's life? Life is comprised of four situations. Ches stands for Chayla, the person who's sick. Yud stands for Yisurim. Yisurim is suffering. And that stands for incarceration. Yam stands for the great sea, the trans-oceanic journey. And Mem stands for Midbar, going across the desert. So the Rebbe says, Rem is Zed, there is Bir. This, this allusion we find a hint of this idea requires some elucidation here the tour just told us that life is made up of mortal danger <laughs> it's the exact opposite of life these are the four things that threaten life how could life be made up of four situations where your life is actually flashing before your eyes these things are mevatas these things are expressive of hepech ha- 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 the opposite of life. 
So the Rebbe says, Vyesh Lavarzais, we could explain the words of the Torah, Al pi ha by virtue of a halacha, and it's found in the Torah Shachan Aruch in chapter 46. And of course, it's discussed at length in the Gemara, where you have a situation of a document, a legal document. It's called a shtar. And sometimes you have a shtar, Shayatza Allah Ir. It's a shtar that the person you bring it to court and a person wants to use the document to, shall we say, to demand a loan or enforce some kind of business arrangement. And the person says it's, it's, it's false. It's a counterfeit document. So that's called a shtar shayatza alav irur. That's a document upon which the question has been raised. The challenge has been posed. It's not real. It's not good. It's counterfeit. It's bad. It can't be used in a court of law. So what happens then? Ubezdin docha esa irur. Bezdin says there's this challenge that's been made. Well, we're going to overcome the challenge. How do you overcome the challenge? It's what's called in today's day and age notarization. If it's a notarized document, you can't come along and dismiss the document. You cannot simply say, ah, it's a, it's a piece of paper. No, no, no. It's a notarized piece of paper. So when they have a situation, the kova shahashtar tokaf, when they say then this shtar, this document is valid, it's effective. Then shuvla nitnal aralov. So if somebody brought an aspersion, cast an aspersion on a legal document, and then the legal document was subsequently notarized, afterwards you can't cast aspersion again. We, you know, we, we did this already. The aspersion was cast, you threw shade, we brought sunlight, there's no questions now. So once you have what's called a notarization, a birur, once we have clarity, then the ability to weaken the document is taken away. So ask yourself the question, as a result of the shade thrown on the document, what happened to the document? It became a weaker document or a stronger document? Stronger. Stronger, because before it was susceptible to an attack. You could, you could delegitimize it. But once you've already answered the delegitimization, then there's nothing to talk about. That question's been answered already. So too, the Rebbe says, we get export the halacha from the laws of documentation and import the halacha into the law of thanksgiving. When a person finds himself in a situation of danger where you don't know life is insecure, and after being fearful for one's life, you're safe in this situation. This situation does not diminish life. This situation enhances life. You appreciate life differently. Why? Because people take things for granted. We live in the age of entitlement. Everything expects, people expect everything. It's coming my way. Who says? Who says? People don't appreciate so much of what they have. They don't appreciate their eyesight, they don't appreciate the hearing, they don't appreciate the coordination, they don't appreciate the digestion, they don't appreciate a lot of things. And what happens, Rahman al a person who was threatened with the ability to lose one of those things, and then he got it back, oh, you don't take anything for granted anymore. This is not just life. Oh, life happens. This is life that was tried and tested. This is life in which there was shade thrown and aspersion cast. This is the life in which you came out of sakonis and kshiyam, a life you came out of danger and you came out of difficulty. You managed to get through them. You managed to overpower those situations. You transcended them. So therefore, life is appreciated differently. As that famous saying, which is a cliche, but still true, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. <laughs> so, ain't masim yeser. There can be no more suitable way to express life rather than the term chayim. Chayim is an acronym. As a rem la arba matzav melo to this kind of situation. Matzavim situations, sham no ma'avim sakona betchila, situations that comprise great danger at first. The point here is not that life is made up of the situations that threaten life. The point here is that life is appreciated when you come out of those situations. After being in the situation and transcending that situation, they enhance, they elevate, they strengthen, they undergird, and they deepen our appreciation of life itself. May we all live appreciatively. 
May we not be threatened with anything. And may we merit, Mir Hashem, to bring the Korban Taida in the third base of Migdash, Bamheira, will be a main. Amen.